Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I could have your attention, uh, we have with us uh, now Admiral Papp, who um, requires no introduction. You heard um, everything you need to hear this morning. Uh, if I could just say that for questions, uh, after he'll deliver a, a five or so minute uh, introduction, for questions, if you could line up uh, behind the microphone, uh, and we'll also be taking questions from Twitter. So if you're watching this uh, online, use the official hashtag of the conference, uh, and our fellows will uh, hopefully take some of your questions uh, from there. So if I could please uh, ask you all to put your hands together for Admiral Papp. Thank you, Ed. Uh, just so I understand the demographics here, how, how many of you are students? Oh, almost all of you. And uh, how many were at the opening plenary session? And how many were there when I spoke? How many stayed awake? <laughs> this is a treat for me. Actually, this is most forward to. I just uh, finished about a half hour uh, with uh, President Grimson, and, and I've been running between officials. We call them uh, bilateral meetings, uh, individuals from other countries, and they've given me an opportunity to do today uh, because uh, everybody wants to talk to the United States. We prepare ourselves for taking over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, but I like to do sessions like this because it reminds me of when I was a ship captain. And uh, I always, as a ship captain, had the opportunity to go out and talk to my crew. And generally, my crew uh, were younger than me. Uh, they look at things from a different perspective. And while oftentimes I had to explain things about the mission we're performing and, uh, and why we're doing it and how it fits into a bigger picture, uh, more uh, they were wondering about how they individually fit into the picture. What, uh, what did this mean to them? And uh, what I found was that even though those, we call them all hands sessions, all hands, all the people on the ship get together and you talk to them, <clears throat> excuse me. But uh, what I found was more important was me listening to them. Because even if it's a question they're asking of me, in that question you often can discern a statement or an opinion or, or something like that. In fact, over time I got to the point where I said, okay, so oh, are there any questions, comments, gripes, or opinions? And, uh, and oftentimes you get all four of those categories uh, from the crowd. Uh, but it always was beneficial to me because it told me about what's on their minds. And as a leader, you want to understand uh, what's going on inside the minds of the people that you're leading. Uh, I, I'm sure that all of you are confronted with decisions on what you want to do uh, with your lives and how you might serve and how you might help the Arctic. Uh, I just talked to... Uh, uh, not too many months ago, before I commented on the Coast Guard, I went back to my high school, and I uh, spoke to the students of my high school, and one of the questions they asked me was, what do we do with our lives? And I guess the first response I had was, do something that you're passionate about. Uh, going to sea and being a sailor, for me, was always a passion. And I have to tell you that I, I, I feel like I never have had a job in my life, because in the Coast Guard, which I was in for 40 years, uh, every day was an adventure. Every day was something new, and, uh, and I was very passionate about what we did. So it didn't feel like a job. It was more of a vocation, something that I really believed in. Uh, the other thing that I recommended to them, that it, what, you don't have to serve or stay in a job or stay in a service for 40 years like I did, but do something at least in the short term to pay back your country, your community, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, all of us uh, just... Uh, by virtue of where we are, being healthy, happy, educated, whatever it might be, and secure, uh, owe that status to other people, whether it's the military, our teachers, uh, our government, whatever it might be. Uh, so why not pay back that system in some way, shape, or form? It doesn't have to be military service. It can be uh, other forms of government service, work within your community, uh, but do something that serves other people. And I guarantee you, in that process, you grow, it strengthens you, it improves your character, and gives you experiences that are going to help you out in whatever you do for the rest of your life. So that's sort of general, general guidance that I try to give to younger people that I work with. 
Uh, more specifically on the Arctic, uh, one of the things that uh, we have done is I've gone, as I mentioned this morning, we've done some listening sessions up uh, in the Arctic. And this was not an original idea of mine. Uh, it was the organizers of my last trip. We did something called Week in the Arctic. Uh, it was, it's scheduled to visit three towns, uh, the towns of Nome, View, and Barrow. Uh, Barrow being the United States' most northernmost country, uh, uh, city, rather, and uh, Nome is a little south of that. Kotzebue is closer to the, uh, the Bering Strait, uh, but very small towns. And part of what we suffer uh, within Alaska uh, with our indigenous population, with our Alaska natives, is they have a hard time keeping the young people at home. Uh, oftentimes people will go off and they will uh, at a certain point have to go to college. Many times they go down to the lower 48 states. And when they see the opportunities and the uh, excitement and, the, uh, and everything else that the lower 48 has to offer, sometimes they just don't come back. What really intrigued me was a young woman in, I think it was Kotzebue, who talked about how uh, after a while down there she realized how much growing up in Alaska had formed her and how much it had meant to her. And she brought her skills back to Alaska to give back to her community. Even though it took time, uh, she, uh, she eventually came back to that in terms of serving her people and serving uh, back in her community. But uh, it was this week of the Arctic that inspired me to start thinking about something we might do as a part of our chairmanship program. At each one of the stops in those three towns, they set up a youth forum. And in fact, I could not attend. I didn't, uh, they, they wanted it only to be the young people coming in and discussing the issues and the problems and the challenges that they're facing. And then what I got to do is I got to listen to the report out later on uh, in terms of what's on their minds, uh, what challenges they're facing. Uh, what are their dreams and their aspirations for either their community or themselves personally. And it, it's very insightful. It's almost like what I talked about, those all-hands meetings, finding out what's on the minds of young people uh, because older people should listen to those things and help, uh, you know, because older people aren't the only ones that have good opinions. Young people have great opinions as well, and they have more at stake because they're going to inherit the world uh, that we're trying to manage. So that's why I'm very happy to be here with all of you, and I'm uh, going to be very happy to uh, listen to uh, your questions, comments, gripes, and opinions. Uh, just one more quick story that I would not be here if it was not for a decision made when I was about your age. Uh, I was facing my uh, choice of first assignment in the Coast Guard. I was graduating from our Coast Guard Academy, our college, and uh, we get an opportunity to pick where we go to. And it started out with the number one person in the class and worked its way all the way down to the last person. Obviously, the last person doesn't get a choice because there's only one job left by the time it gets to the last person. I was not last, but I was not far from last. And uh, we went through a couple of practice runs, and it looked like I was going to end up on a big Coast Guard cutter either in Boston or New York. But on the night of the, uh, the formal selections, uh, when I went into the room to make my selection, the guy coming out said, hey, Pap, there's one left in Alaska. Uh, so I said, Alaska, that sounds very exciting. Uh, and I looked uh, at the type of ship, it was the type of ship I wanted to be on, and it was home ported in a place called ADAC. And I said, I wonder where that is. That's ah, Alaska. It's, it's got to be exciting and it's going to be an adventure. So I opened up an atlas when I got back to my room, and believe me, if you go into an atlas, it'll be about two pages worth of mainland Alaska and maybe part of the peninsula. And then there's an inset on the map that has the first part of the Aleutian chain, and then there's another inset that has the remainder of the Aleutian chain, and ADAC's about halfway through the second inset. And I said, that's not good. <laughs> And uh, it really wasn't good when I had to go home and explain to my fiance that we weren't going to be in Boston or New York, but we're going to be a little island called ADAC in Alaska. But she survived, uh, and uh, 40 years later, she's still with me. And uh, you know, sometimes the, uh, the choices that you make in your youth, while they might not appear to be wise or well thought out, 
uh, sometimes bring you to a position. If I had not gone to Alaska in that first assignment, I guarantee you I would not be here today. So it, it's good to be here today, and uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you. If you could line up um, behind the question. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much for speaking with us. This is really awesome. Um, my name is Leahy. I'm a Canadian, but I study at Dartmouth College in the U.S. And about two weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C. for a high-level meeting as a note-taker um, of um, Arctic officials. And Julie Gurley, who's the senior Arctic official for the U.S., was there. And I was definitely the youngest person there. And I remember all of these, you know, older people talking about what they, wanted to talk, what they wanted to do when it comes to the future of the Arctic and the U.S. Arctic Council Chairmanship. And everyone mentioned millennials and young people and how young people care about the Arctic, um, but they didn't really talk about how to directly engage us. Um, you know, youth, we're a third party, and these kinds of events were great, but again, we're in plenary hall talking to everyone who is here. We're on the outskirts. And so my question is to you, and I'm really hoping, I know this is a big question, but I'm hoping you have a more specific answer than what I usually get, which is, oh, we need youth. Um, how can, how can um, people such as you, um, how can we push um, elected officials to engage youth in a more tangential way when it comes to Arctic issues? Not just, you know, on some kind of side event, but in some real way where we have a seat at the table. And also, just looking around the room, you know, how can we engage indigenous youth? I think this is a great event, but I also feel like, um, myself included, many people here are southerners. And so, how do we really engage the people who are on the front lines of these communities um, and are not as represented when it comes to the actual decision making and not just tokenizing us? Yeah. What, what province or town are you from? I'm from Montreal. Oh, okay, great. Uh, well, first of all, you can't give it lip service, as you suggested, and what you have to do is actively get out there and seek counsel. Uh, once again, I learned it through my profession because uh, when, I was, when I had the crews of my ships, uh, generally most of the young men and women who were working for me were 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh, most enlisted people in the Coast Guard go right from high school and go to a boot camp and then come out, and uh, you have to learn culturally as well to help to understand them. Uh, fortunately, I had three daughters who oftentimes were about the same age as my crew members uh, that I was dealing with. So uh, uh, it actually, I think, helped me to be a better father because I was listening to uh, the young people in my crews and understanding a little bit more about my daughters. Uh, and uh, this is a practice that I carried for even, even after I stopped serving in ships as a district commander, and even as the commandant of the Coast Guard. Every place we traveled, we would do all hands meetings. Uh, they were, uh, uh, more often than not, they were three, four, five hundred people in a room uh, with me responding to their questions and soliciting their advice and counsel on, you know, tell me what, tell me what I'm doing wrong about doing the Coast Guard or, tell me, or leading the Coast Guard. Or tell me what you think I could do better or what you would do if you were the commandant. My wife would do the same thing. She would go have meetings with their spouses and talk to the young women, and in some cases now young men who are spouses to uh, women Coast Guardsmen, and try to get into them. So you have to make a conscious and sincere effort. And many times it takes time to build up that sense, that bond of trust, but one time. If I went out and I did that one time and never repeated it, people would uh, rightly say you were insincere about it and you don't really want to listen to us. But you have to do it with regularity. You have to go back, and you, you, you have to uh, uh, be consistent in a conference or anything else. You have to ask that question and say, are we including the young people? What sort of venue can we have where I can listen to them? And uh, you know, sometimes, because of the hundreds of things we're thinking about, sometimes we just need to be reminded. So become an activist. When you see leaders that aren't including you, ask why. And oftentimes it may be they'll say, gee, just didn't think about that. That's a great idea. And what do you suggest? How can we engage? And so you've got to pull uh, in it as well. Have an opinion about it. Be active. Cool. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jared. I'm the Associate Executive Director uh, for the Youth Arctic Coalition. 
Um, so us kind of at our conception of the organization, we wanted to create a forum communication and leadership for young people who live in the eight Arctic states. And obviously one of the realities that, that we realized going into the organization is that the Arctic Council is the entity in the Arctic, uh, kind of like we could use like a supreme entity in the Arctic. Um, so I asked this question to Vincent Rigby uh, earlier today, um, but I'd like to hear your opinion. How do you see youth getting involved in, in the Arctic Council? And kind of going back on your answer to the last question, why haven't they been yet? How do I see them becoming involved? Facebook. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. Uh, I found out when I was traveling around because I listened that one of the forms of communications between the villages up there is Facebook. They want to know what their tribe, what their neighbors, what their family members are doing. And they, are, uh, they have found Facebook to be a, a great venue for doing that. Herein lies the challenge, though, and uh, part of the thing that the Arctic Council needs to address, and this is one of the things on the United States agenda, is connectivity. Uh, if you go up to the villages that I just went to, uh, when I went to Kotzebue, for instance, uh, there's no fiber optics. Uh, they're still relying upon microwave off satellites to, uh, to communicate. Uh, when I went up to Barrow, uh, I talked to a woman up there. They've got a, they've got a modern hospital that was built, but they don't have enough, a lot of uh, technicians. So she had to go in for a CAT scan. They don't have a technician that can read the CAT scan there in Barrow, so they have to transmit the data. It took three hours to transmit the data, something that should be done in five minutes or less. It took three hours to transmit the data because they had to go uh, beam it off a satellite and down into the lower 48. Shell Oil, uh, another example. When they get out there on their ships and they were drilling and they were bouncing around, they would lose microwave connection to the satellite because the satellites are not optimally positioned for the high latitudes, so you lose your line of sight and you lose your communication capability. So we're, part of our project is uh, uh, telecommunications. How do we improve it? Uh, one big thing is going to be to get fiber optics up through uh, mainland Alaska so that we can start getting people able to communicate better. Uh, we all know, I, I have, uh, and it's been pounded into me by my daughters, that that's how people communicate nowadays. I mean, uh, texting and everything else, that really wasn't my bag, but I've had to get into it if I want to talk to the young people that, uh, uh, that I deal with. So uh, social media. Uh, is a big thing, and I think that's the thing that we should leverage more so that we can keep uh, people involved, particularly uh, in the villages in the far north. Thank you. Speaking of which, I think we might have a question from the, the web. Actually, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> that's okay. Um, hi, thank you so much for addressing us today. Uh, my name is Dayanita, and I'm an Arctic Climate Change Emerging Leaders Fellow um, based at the Atlantic Council in D.C. Ah. Um, and so earlier today, um, during your a speech at the plenary, you mentioned um, about wanting to help improve living standards. And so uh, my question is uh, about how, you know, whether this is part of the, um, the U.S. chairmanship that's coming up, how you plan to, you know, engage with indigenous youth, you know, in parts of Alaska that have, you know, health and sanitation issues. And, um, you know, my table is discussing food security. Um, and subsistence hunting, which is being threatened because of climate change. And, um, you know, is this just um, an education problem? Is this something, you know, that, that younger people in those regions can be, you know, can they just learn training? Is it something like that? So, thank you. No, I, I think it's a, uh, it's part of it's a resourcing issue. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's not just, we have already identified the problems. Uh, part of the challenge that we have, and, and I've listened to many groups up there now, uh, we have villages where there's no running water, uh, where they have to pump water. Or if you have running water because <clears throat> you can't, uh, you have to keep the lines heated yeah. uh, in order to keep water running. Uh, you have uh, concerns about the permafrost and running things through it. So you have to insulate the pipe so it doesn't melt the permafrost, yet have heating inside the pipe so it keeps the water flowing. It becomes tremendously expensive. When it becomes expensive, people don't want to use their water because then they get a huge water bill. Mm -hmm. So they don't use the water, they don't wash their hands. And if you don't wash your hands, we all know what happens there. You have communicable diseases. Uh, so fresh water, proper sanitation, uh, and uh, how do we come up with uh, reliable, renewable energy 
uh, for many of the villages that we have, to have up there. Uh, so we're going to advocate for uh, pilot projects uh, with uh, small scale, small grid, uh, sustainable, whether it's wind, thermal energy. Uh, what we need to do away with is uh, diesel generators running constantly, uh, producing black carbon and, uh, and very expensive to run because of the costs of fuel in Alaska. And I, and I think that's applicable across uh, the, uh, the peoples of the north. And uh, there are some places where they've had successful either wind energy or, or combinations of solar and wind and whatever. And uh, we want to advance some test projects there, as well as surveying the water situations throughout the Arctic and seeing what we might be able to do to come up with a better way of providing uh, fresh water for our people. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been really interesting. Um, I'm Jess Newman. Um, I'm a student at the Harvard Kennedy School, so it was great to hear that you had been there recently. Um, so my question is, I guess, around female leadership um, on Arctic issues. When we looked at the panels that were presenting this morning, very interesting, very excellent, disproportionately male. Um, so I guess I'm thinking, as the U.S. assumes kind of leadership of the Arctic Council, how do you plan to kind of promote and engage female leadership and female youth leadership? And, and I guess to kind of preemptively push back, I know when we had the first question about how to get youth involved, you said part of the answer was saying, well, why am I not involved? And when I think about kind of some of the reasons why women aren't engaged in leadership, it's a lot of time because they're not culturally comfortable asking that question. Um, and so I guess my question is how, how do you think that the U.S. leadership and future leadership at the Council can proactively engage women in a way that kind of surpasses tokenism? Wow, there is, uh, well, believe me, in my life, I see no tokenism whatsoever. Uh, first of all, let me introduce uh, Ms. Hillary LaBelle, uh, who is one of my Arctic advisors. Now, I've never asked Hillary her name, but, uh, her age, rather, but she's, she's young. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we just, uh, I, I guess I would say, I'm gonna, I guess this is going on on the web, so I might get in trouble, but we stole her away from <laughs> EPA. Uh, but uh, for good reason. Uh, she had been selected uh, at a very early age in government service, once again, going back to serving, paying back. Uh, she was working, uh, I, I said EPA, I meant FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency. Uh, within the Department of Homeland Security, my mistake. But uh, she was selected as a presidential management fellow and she went and she spent some time working at the Coast Guard on a detail. <clears throat> she happened to be at the Coast Guard. I was leading an effort to produce the Coast Guard Arctic strategy, so she had some, uh, some input there. Uh, then she did a second detail to the State Department. She was working at the State Department when I arrived and because of her background at Coast Guard, I believe they put her in, in our polar division and was working uh, Arctic affairs as well. So it seemed to make sense to me that uh, uh, with all this Arctic experience, it was going to go to waste if she went back to, uh, uh, to FEMA. So uh, that is not tokenism. That is appreciating the value of the intellect and the experience and picking the best person for the job. Uh, and I don't know whether it's because I have daughters or because the Coast Guard's been very progressive in terms of women. Uh, the, we were the first service academy to admit women. Uh, at one point uh, during my time as commandant, uh, I have my wife, I have three daughters, two granddaughters, my vice commandant, the number two person in the Coast Guard is a woman, the, uh, my boss, the, uh, the uh, secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano is a woman. Uh, the, uh, the Deputy Secretary, Jane Lute, was a woman, and uh, my uh, primary care physician is a woman. I mean, I'm, I'm surrounded by women. My wife says it takes that many women to keep me in line. But uh, I, I, I think, to be fair, there are a lot of people who, like me, believe that we go for the best person. Do we sometimes give people an, a little bit more of an opportunity to open things up to women in non-traditional fields? Yes, we do from time to time. Uh, but we uh, generally always go for the best qualified person. Uh, within my office, I'm the only guy. I've got uh, Hillary, and I brought a woman over from the, the Coast Guard uh, who was a civilian employee who uh, was my strategic planner and scheduler, and she's now my chief of staff. Uh, over there. So, and, and to me, I don't really even think about it being men or women. It's just that I've got the best people and they happen to be women. Good. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So, unfortunately, just one final question, um, please. 
Hello, thank you for addressing us today. Um, my question is about education, but I should give you a little bit of my background to frame this first. I am doing a master's degree here at the Reykjavik University in sustainable energy engineering, but I was born and raised in the Yukon. So I would be not really indigenous because I would be uh, shot down for saying that, but I am from the North. And, uh, and you're, I, you address this sort of uh, the education issue, but not with any answers. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm obviously not in Canada or even in the Yukon doing my degree. I've come all the way to Iceland to do this. And, and my plan is to go back, but for so many of us, we don't. How is the Arctic Council going to address the education issues in the North during the U.S.'s chairmanship, or are they? Is this going to be something for a later time? Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I'm going to be completely candid with you. It's something we have not discussed, but it's become a, uh, an area of interest to me. Not necessarily education. Uh, what I'm finding out, there are a lot of young people who leave the villages to go get the education. The challenge is getting them to come back. And that's where this sort of spirit of service, sacrifice, and giving back to your community comes in. The woman that I told you about uh, that was in one of the sessions uh, that I attended uh, during the week in the Arctic, uh, it just clicked for her at, at some point in time that, uh, you know something, I, I had it really good back in the village. The, uh, the character and, uh, and life lessons I learned were passed on to me by my elders. I can take what I'm doing and I can go back uh, wasn't that, an, oh, you weren't with me, I'm sorry, Jen, Jennifer was with me on that trip. Uh, I, I, my recollection is she, she's a uh, um, certified uh, practical nurse, and she went back to give back to her community. She could have made much more money down in the lower 48 and had all the, uh, that the lower 48 has to offer, but she chose to go back to her village and, and help and give back. And uh, as I said, at the end of the day, at the end of our, our lives, uh, what we really want to do is to be able to look back and say, how did we contribute? Uh, I would ask you, chance, uh, Google or look up a song called uh, American Anthem and listen to it. It's uh, the original version I heard is by uh, Nora Jones. And she sings it in a very slow and, uh, and, and lovely version. Uh, I kind of like the way the Coast Guard band and our vocalist does it, but it's my favorite song. And uh, in the first verse, it uh, ends up asking the question, what will be my legacy? What will my children say? And then the chorus answers the question, let them say of me, I was one who believed in returning the blessings I've received. Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, America, I gave my best to you. I, I get tears in my eyes whenever I hear that song because I've known so many young people who step forward and volunteer their lives in service. And at the end of the day, when we look back and we reflect, are we gonna be proud of what we did? Uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of money in the bank and, and possessions. Uh, but what do we have, what have we done that's made a real impact on the lives of others and for the betterment of our country or, or the world? And that's the question I would pose to all of you. What are you going to do? What will be your legacy? What will your children say? Thank you very much for having me in here. Sorry, we have one, actually oh, one more okay. question, because uh, one's come in uh, from the World Wide Web. Um, so off uh, Twitter, the question is, uh, is the administration going to work on a more concerted push for new icebreakers? <laughs> there must be a Coast Guardsman out there uh, yeah. sending that in. Uh, well, that goes back to my previous career in the Coast Guard. And uh, yes, uh, I can't speak for the current, the new commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that he is pushing just as I did. Uh, for the United States, for the uh, administration and the Congress uh, to uh, come up with a wherewithal to uh, fund the construction of a new icebreaker. Uh, we have one relatively new icebreaker that's about 16 years old right now. It's, uh, it's a medium icebreaker, but our two heavy breakers that we use can use in the Arctic or in the Antarctic 
because you know we, we're focused on the Arctic, but the United States has responsibilities in the Antarctic as well. We have scientific uh, programs down there that require resupply, breaking into McMurdo Sound each year. And uh, right now, we've only got one icebreaker that can do that, and it's 35 years old. Uh, the other 35-year-old icebreaker is laid up at the pier in Seattle because we don't have the money to renovate it. Uh, what we really need to do is be about the business of buying uh, an icebreaker. Uh, estimates are it will cost about a billion dollars. But, uh, you know, Navy spends about six, seven, eight billion dollars on an aircraft carrier, and we've got uh, 11 or 12 of those. Uh, I would think we could find one billion dollars to build an icebreaker to be able to take care of our responsibilities in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But that's uh, selfless advertisement right there, and I thank whoever sent that question in. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be in here. Admiral Papa, I think I speak for all of us uh, in saying that this has been a real, real highlight uh, of our day and worth even the trip to Iceland just to be at this uh, session. So thank you. And one thing you said earlier today, most Americans don't really consider themselves uh, co as coming from an Arctic country. It really points to the fact that outreach is perhaps one of the most important ways forward, as you said, and that's exactly the role of our Excel Fellowship as well as all the youth groups here. So thank you so much, and I think we're aligned in our views on... Um, thank you.